Again, thank you, Jack, for this uh, riveting topic you've given to me. <laughs> Little did he know I have a fear of death. If you ask anyone in my family or anyone that's close to me, it's an unnatural fear of death. Even though I do believe uh, deeply in the cross and in, in what Jesus did to transform our lives, it's still this not really kind of knowing stuff just bothers me. And I've often said it's not the fear of being dead, it's the fear of getting dead that I don't like that whole getting there. And according to Jack, I'm on my way, apparently. <laughs> when I talked about this at our, at our church, uh, a young man said, afterlife, how can there be life after death? That just doesn't make any sense. And that's what we wonder a lot of times. In that video that we saw, you know, I just caught this as, as I saw it this morning. One young lady says, I'm going to be free to do what I want. And I think theologically, she's got it. I think she understands this idea that our desires become God's desires and his desires become our desires. He's going to let us do what we want to do. And that could be heaven or that could be hell, couldn't it? Theologically, if he releases us to do those things we choose to do here on earth more and more and more, he's releasing us to be free. That's what we're going to talk about today. It's, it's a topic that is, that is close to some of us, closer to some of us than others. Some of us may be dealing with death right now. They may be dealing death, with the death of a loved one. They may have had a, 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 an unfortunate visit to the doctor where they're looking at this. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is in a book called Preparing for Heaven. Gary Black Jr., a theologian out of Azusa Pacific uh, University, had the opportunity to work with Dallas Willard in the later years of his life. And if anyone knows me, they know that I'm a big fan of Dallas Willard and his theology. But he was able to accompany Dallas in the last, especially the last three weeks of his life here on earth, as he transitioned, as Dallas would say, into the next life. And as he was going through some notes, he actually went into Dallas's study and found a peach crate filled with notes on the afterlife that Dallas had uh, assembled over decades of teachings, philosophy at the University of Southern California, and then at Fuller Theological Seminary. And all of Dallas's thoughts about the afterlife were in this. And he actually, as they were walking one day, a couple weeks before Dallas passed away, he told, turned to Gary and he said, I want you to write a book on this topic. And, and, and Gary jokingly says, is that a deathbed request? And Dallas turns to him soberly and says, yes. This is an important enough topic, and I'm facing it right now that I want to give my thoughts on what this looks like and what this feels like. So if you have the opportunity, it's kind of a heart-wrenching book in some degrees, but it's definitely worth the read. But a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about, because we really don't know what death is like, do we? I mean, we know getting dead. We've seen glimpses of that. We've accompanied people in that process as, as hard as that is and everything. But that moment after we die, what is that like? I've always said, uh, the moment after I die, what do I want people to say about me? Look, he's moving. That's what I want people to say about me. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. This is a, to this is a topic that I struggle with, <laughs> right? Because I'm not 100% sure. I know theologically, I know what, what, what I believe happens when I die, but, but as I understand it, and most of the world is, is trying to cheat death at all costs, Right? It, it, there's a, a report on CBS News in 2009 that Medicare paid approximately $50 billion in medical costs during the last two months of people's lives. And there's debate whether it affected their quality of life at all. $50 billion is more than we spend on education in this country. But Medicare spent that in the last two months of people's lives because we cling to this life partly because we're really not sure What's going to happen that moment after death? There's some things we read in Scripture. If we're a Christ follower, there's some things that we kind of believe and we hold on to, those truths of, you know, there'll be no more tears and all these things, and, and, and sin is going to go away, and all those things that those kids talked about are true to a degree other than the pink sky is, is, is true to a degree, but it still doesn't help in that moment because there's a time after we die, as we read in Scripture, between the second coming of Christ, which is somewhere in the future, that is kind of unknown. The Catholics would teach us that it's purgatory. 
And that isn't pleasant at all if you've ever read any of the purgatory stuff. It's a little bit of suffering, but not too bad until you've made up for all the bad stuff that you've done. But maybe it's my Catholic upbringing or whatever, but I have this, this misconception and confusion about uh, when I, the, the moment after I die. So it causes fear. It causes me not to think about it. It causes me not to prepare for it. It causes me not to even to, to just hope for the best. You know, I hope so. But I have all, I've realized as I've, thank you, Jack, by the way, as I've researched the afterlife and really thought about what I believe, that most of my theology about the afterlife is based on Jesus' story of the sheep and the goats. Right? The sheep and the goats, you, you probably know the parable. Jesus is talking about uh, when people, after people die, they go before God. And, he's, and, and they said, to one group, he says, depart from me, I never knew you, into the lake of fire where they're burning and gnashing of teeth and fire and brimstone and all that stuff. The other was come into your rest, and both of them are clueless. When, when, what, what's going on? When did we give you a cup of water? When did we help you? When, when, when? So I've, I've had this mentality, and maybe others share this, that we're going to get to heaven, we're going to be, be before this big kind of... Uh, either a throne or usually it's like a desk with St. Peter sitting there and a couple of other saints, right? And we have this idea that we get to heaven up this escalator and, and then we have a movie of our life, right? And everything we've ever done is going to be shown before God and everybody right there. And my fear is like how ashamed I would be, right? And all of a sudden God's going to go, guess what? Well, you know what? You are on the naughty list, and he pulls this big lever, and kaboom, psh, and I'm going down. And that's what that, you know, honestly, that's, it, it, it's silly, right? But as I've, under, it, because I have this fear of getting dead and the fear of dying, that's really, 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 deep down as I pare everything away, my fear. Now, it's incongruent with the God of the Bible. It's incongruent with what I know of Jesus who represents God on earth. And it's even incongruent with most of Scripture because most of our ideas of heaven and hell are based on medieval understandings of heaven and hell. Dante's great tragedy is, is a three-part play about uh, he heaven and hell and purgatory and all that stuff. And in it is a Dante's Inferno. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Uh, you can't read it to it, but, but Dante in his wisdom has, has categorized sins and levels of hell all the way down to the bottom and this lake of fire and all these hoops, and it's specific. I mean, there's like, you know, traitors, and there's all kinds of specific things in it. And here, 700 years later, our concept of hell hasn't really changed much. It's pitchforks and fire and tearing at flesh and all this weird stuff. And I, I would submit to you, heaven similarly is, is, is not changed in our understanding, but for most of us, it's just confusion. But we do understand, I hope, that if, we're, if we have any belief in God, that we, we, we understand that we are eternal beings. But our understanding of heaven is a, a celestial Fort Lauderdale, right? We're going to be all kind of in our Hawaiian shirts, sitting on a deck, sipping a drink with a little thing on top of it, or a, a, a celestial pelican lakes for Jack, because he'll be just hitting that long ball all day long, right? For me, that would be a little less than heaven, <laughs> because if you've ever golfed with me, and Jack has, it would be less than heaven for me and for him if we ever had to spend the rest of eternity golfing together. But there's some things we know about heaven, right? And that's what I want to kind of look at, those, those things that we, we, we know, and then maybe talk a little bit. Because there's an underlying belief in most of Western society and most of Christianity that somehow that, that we change ontologically on the moment we die, that, that we become something other than human when we die. We become an angel. We get wings. The bell rings, and we get our wings, and we have a cloud, and we get, you know, it, it, it's, it seems silly when we talk about it, but we do believe that when we, care, we don't carry anything of this life into heaven. That's just absurd. The only thing we have to offer to God is our life. Why would we leave it behind? That, that which makes us us, that at the very essence of who we are, those kingdom things that are us, Dallas would, would, would posit that we take that into heaven. Now, so change does, transformation does happen when we go to heaven. Dallas called it a cosmic car wash. We go, we go through a cosmic car wash when we die, 
right? And, and part of us, that, that, that part of us which is sin, that part of us which, is, which, which is causes us to choose wrong things, attempts us, all those things are washed away. But that which really makes us us, and that, 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 those choices that we make, those things we choose to build, according to him, continues on for a period of time. There's, there's, there seems to be, we take ourselves, our memories, our characters, our personhoods, our spirits, our souls with us into this, this, this time called paradise. Death frees us from our earthly limitations, the web of lies that misrepresent the truth, the systems of the world that create entanglements, some of which are present in our own religions. These bonds of sin are washed away, but we don't become something ontologically different. We become, if anything, more human as we enter this place called paradise. Now, here's the confusion. A lot of us have been taught or possibly think that there's going to be this judgment that happens as soon as we die, and I always feared this. But when I read Scripture, there's a time, there's a space between the time we die and that actual judgment. That judgment comes in Revelation at the end of the book, right? He's going to sort everything out. He's going to, he's going to have, you know, earth 2.0. He's going to, earth, the new Jerusalem is going to come down to this earth, and, and he, finally he's going to say, time's up, we are done, that's it. But we know from Jesus' own words, there's a space in between that from the time we die until that comes. In fact, Jesus says to the thief on the cross, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. This thief never, as I read, prayed a prayer or did anything in his life. But he said, today, you're with me. Now, he's either the luckiest guy in the history of the world or he's carrying something into the immediate right now, this thing called paradise, this afterlife, time. And what does that look like? What is that? What is that? What is that, that space? Sin, the effects of the fall will be gone when we enter into it, when we pass through the veil. The effects of the fall will be gone and we'll just have this other thing to continue to choose. What, why would we not no longer have free will. Why, why in heaven would all of a sudden we be changed to the point we don't have the opportunity to choose those things of God? See, see, the idea that we're transformed into something completely different means that God would have to take away free will because I know I struggle with not choosing the right things now. But if I can condition myself now, and that's what we're going to talk about, preparing for heaven, getting ready for the eternal, if I, if I can condition myself to want to choose the right things now, I carry that into heaven, and it just gets exponentially more and more better. Conversely, if I don't, C.S. Lewis teaches this, if I don't choose that, and I don't choose to choose the path of God, I don't choose and continually, continually choose those things that are destructive in my life. Maybe God just pulls away his grace and allows me to continue to choose that. Maybe that's actually hell and it's not actually a place. Maybe it's just a removal of all things that are good from your existence and allowing you to choose what you've always chosen throughout your life. See, this concept of heaven and paradise causes me to live differently now, because I take something with me, something to give to God and go, this is what I, this, see how far I've come. It's like when my daughter made the, um, she made a coat rack when she was in the seventh grade, and I love that coat rack. That coat rack will not hang a coat on it to save its life, because everything is crooked on it. <laughs> but I have that coat rack in my garage, every house we've ever lived, because that's my daughter's. She made that, right? That's how I feel about that coat rack. So no matter how poorly I've done in earth leaning into those maybe kingdom of God stuff, I offer it to God, and the sin is washed away in the car wash. And he goes, yeah, we can do something with that. So Dallas believes then in the, in the, in the, in the presence of God and relationships, we continue to work on that until such a time comes when God says, okay, we're done. Let's reboot this thing. Let's start over. And as we read it in Revelation, the new heaven and the new earth comes down. And guess what we do? We rule with God on the earth. We'll get, we'll get to those. I'm getting way off my notes. But I'm super excited about this stuff because it's freed me from a lot of fear of getting dead and being dead. Because Dallas Willard used to talk about, I should think that when I die, it would be some time before I realize it. 
In other words, he's going to live his life in the kingdom of God, in the presence of God, as it, we know it infiltrates all of the world right now. He's going to live into that reality and that goodness and that kindness and all that stuff and work on his bad stuff and be the best that he can be. And then all of a sudden he's going to realize, oh, what just happened? Oh, okay. And if you read this book, you can see the glimpses in the last few days, last few hours, last minutes of his life. He was able to kind of transition and pass through and continue on. Revelation 5 says, You have made them to be a kingdom of priests, a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. What's coming at some point is you and I and those of us who, who, who have, have embraced the kingdom of God will reign with God on earth. That isn't, I'm not ready for that right now. You saw Bruce Almighty. I would be worse than Bruce Almighty. If I got the ability to reign with God right now, things would be a mess. People would be smitten all over the place, and, you know, it would be just, it would be a mess. I would, I would give my character, my, my being isn't developed to the place where I can handle all this power, all this, all this joy, all this stuff of heaven. So what makes me think I'm going to, in any way, be able to embrace it when I get there? I need some time. <laughs> And this is encouraging to me because I need a lot of time. You ask my wife, I need a lot of time. And another 20 or 30 years isn't enough to get it. I'm guaranteeing it. The original job we had in the garden, if you read the story in Genesis, was to rule over the earth, to, to maintain it, to rule with God in the earth. And something broke, something happened, as we know. That's where we're headed back to at some point in the future. But I would submit to you, it's not the moment we die. Again, I submit it to you. Because I won't be ready to do that when I die. I, don't, I, I would hope that I would, but I, time's ticking, as Jack, as Jack told you. It's getting closer and closer, and I'm on the downward spiral, right? So most of us, though, most of us don't do much to prepare for heaven. We try and do good stuff. We try and work on our care. We try and do all these things. But are we preparing for eternity? Because this thing goes on for eternity. For eternity. We, we blaze right through death and keep on going. Right? We are, we are people who are eternal. There's a couple promises. We really don't know because, because we haven't, none of us have survived death. Some of us had near-death experiences, and they've written books, and it's, it's all, I'm, I'm, I'm not doubting any of their uh, recollections of that. Even in this book that, that, I, that I've been reading, there's a glimpse where Dallas was fading, actually, uh, according to the author, between the veil. It was just the last moments before he died. And he talks about, you know, this hallway, and he talks about this kind of thing. Uh, it, it's pretty, pretty compelling, but we really don't know. A few things we can say that God promises to complete us Interesting. Complete us. Philippians 1 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now we could debate for hours when the day of Christ Jesus is and all these things, but doesn't it make sense that he would continue to complete us even after we're dead? Continue to cause us to, 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 to become those types of, of beings. The other theory is we completely change as soon as we die and everything is changed. And that, 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 I guess that's a viable theory, but it doesn't, for me, it doesn't cause me to live any differently because I can just live however I want to because as long as I've prayed a prayer, when I die, I'm going to be magically changed into this wonderful being who's going to be all-loving and all-knowing and all, not all-knowing, but all-loving and all-kind and all those things that we see in the fruit of the Spirit and able to handle the power to rule the cosmos according to Revelation. That's, that's, a, that's tough for me. But if I take my life as I've been, I've been working on it to be conformed and transformed into the image of Christ, and I take that part of me and peel away the sin and peel away the institutions and peel away all the other things that are affiliated with the fall of man and take that into eternity and continue to, to in the presence of God and in the presence of 
deep relationships with others, I can work on that and continue to make myself and allow God to make me into that thing that I so long to be on this side of the veil, man, sign me up. Because then I can live differently now and then I don't have to freak out that I'm doing enough stuff now before I die. Oh my gosh, it's getting shorter. I got to do more stuff. Or just give up and say, I'm going to be changed anyway, so I might as well just be a jerk now because I'm going to be transformed, right? He promises to complete us. One of the primary reasons, Dallas says, that human beings were created is to demonstrate to the universe the richness and amazing power that God maintains and wields to bring creative goodness out of all things. Creative goodness out of all things. This is why so much of human existence begins to make sense only in the light of the reality of God's kingdom. He also promised to complete his mission here on earth, bringing out of human history a personal, relational community of immortal beings that will be God's primary dwelling place for all of eternity. That's what he's trying to do in the kingdom, is, he, is, is prepare us and help us prepare to be eternal dwelling for the presence of God. Man, that changes how I live my life now. If this plan doesn't seem a worthy vocation wherein one can submit and commit their life towards seeking, heaven will be a most confusing, even discomforting place. He also promised good things, 1 Corinthians 2. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. Jesus says, I go and I prepare a place. I go and I prepare a place. And when you pass through this veil, you're going to be surrounded by all those who have gone before. And you're going to continue that work that began when you gave your life over to the Creator, which is a life not of, of right and wrong and knowing the right things and spouting the right things and going to the right places and doing all the right. It's a, it's a, it's a life of transformation and conformation into the likeness of Jesus. Discipleship, you might want to call it. Continuing, continuing, continuing to recognize those things of the kingdom and live into those realities. He also promises to make all things new. Revelation 21, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He was seated on the throne and said, I behold, I am making all things new. You and I are eternal beings. The very foundational, fundamental premise of any religion is that we are eternal beings. And we will live on for eternity. Scripture even says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of men in Ecclesiastes. Eternity in the hearts of men. Yet we live like everything is finite. We live like death is the end. We live like I got to grab as much as I can, as quick as I can, because someday the lights are going to be out, and after that, really, who knows? All bets are off. Hopefully it's good, but it might be the trap door thing, right? Kaboosh. Okay, I got to get that out of my mind. <laughs> no trap doors in heaven. That should have been the title of this. God has placed eternity in our hearts, so why don't we spend more time living into and preparing for eternity than preparing for and living into extending this life and keeping this life and holding on to this life? C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity writes this, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Some have said that health and fitness and diet and all those things are the new idol for humanity, even especially, specifically for Christians. 
that we spend billions and billions and billions of dollars to extend life. And I'm not against living healthy. Look at me. <laughs> I'm not against, I am not against that at all, but we seem to be so fearful of what's going to happen on the other side that we cling to it tenaciously and spend billions of dollars and spend tons of time reading and researching and doing the latest thing instead of maybe spending more time on our own character and who we're becoming now. Because the only thing we take, there are no U-Hauls behind hearses. You've heard that story, right? But maybe we do take something into heaven. Maybe we do offer our lives, right? Revelation talks about laying down crowns before the, the Lamb of God, all this beautiful, fiery, wonderful imagery. Maybe those crowns that we're laying down are alive. That's what I've done so far. Can you do anything with that? Yeah, okay, come on in. And it's not works, it's not things, it's not money we spend, it's not edifices we built, it's not any of those things, but it's who we've become and who, how we've perpetuated the kingdom of God in those lives around us. Right? Maybe. I don't know about you, but if I'm packing for a trip, if my wife's packing for a trip, she usually gets a suitcase out ahead of time, sometimes a week ahead of time. You, any, you one of those people that doesn't? Yeah. She'll, she'll look through her stuff and she'll, oh, I'm going to need that. You know, I'm probably going to need underwear. I'll pack that. I'm going to put that on. Wash some stuff. Get some new stuff. I need one of those. I don't have one of those. I need to get one of those. Pack it all up. When it's time to leave, she's packed, ready to go to wherever. Me the night before. Maybe that morning throwing stuff in a suitcase and plug, I think I need four sweatshirts. I don't know. We're going to Florida. I, I don't know how many bathing suits I've had to buy. Toothbrushes, right? In fact, we went to Italy and I had to wear European spandex to ride a bicycle. <laughs> Delete that thought from your mind. Right? I mean, I, last minute, why? We are on a journey <laughs> Stop thinking about it. <laughs> We're on a journey into eternity. We can't get off the boat. We can't say, I don't want to be in eternity. I just want to, you know, feed the gophers. That's all. I just want it to be done. It's a nice delusion that it ends when we die. It's a nice delusion but I don't think we do. So we're going to live in eternity. And our choices then possibly affect our eternity. The degree, the, the, the degree to which I live in the reality of the kingdom of heaven now will have a huge impact on what it will be like after my physical death. And if I haven't chose life and goodness, and creativity, and joy, and peace, and kindness, and gentleness, and so all those things. Now, what makes me think I'm going to choose it? Unless God takes away free will and makes me choose it. It doesn't make sense to me. The New Testament describes the life as one generated and sustained from above, from the heavens, which can start now and continue forever. Philippians 3 says, we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. He's, he's, he's writing to the Philippians 2,000 years ago, real time. We are citizens of heaven. You're, 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 see, people hundreds of years ago believed that they were just journeying here, sojourners they called them, right? And I believe this, the word to saunter means to just journey. To, the word sauntering means to just, I'm on a journey. I'm on a pilgrimage through eternity. We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body at some point in the future. Eternity starts now, not when I die. The kingdom of heaven is in breaking now. We don't have to wait until we die. The 
The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10, 10 says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full now. That you can experience eternity, you can experience glimpses of paradise now in our lives. And I know that's some hard for, harder for some of us to understand than others. Some of our lives are extremely difficult. Uh, it's, it's difficult for us to understand how there can be glimpses of the kingdom. But if we set our minds on the things above, as it says in Scripture, and begin you to work on those things that are intangibles like love and joy and peace and kindness and gentleness and self-control and goodness. Those transcend, you know, uh, earthly kinds of things. I love the message paraphrase of John 10.10. 10. Listen to what Eugene Peterson writes. I came, Jesus talking, so they can have real and eternal life more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Truth is, we can find that abundant life long before we die. Dallas Willard set out early in his life to pursue the kingdom of God in his own life and in those lives of his students and his family and his friends and to live into that reality. This fact can shape our view of eternal life. Are we preparing our lives, filling our days, and directing our minds and bodies toward the good life Jesus offers us that begins right now and extends to eternity? How do we become the kinds of people that can endure the visceral nature of heaven, the, the gut-level nature of heaven? How can we become the kind of people who could rule with God in the cosmos? See, we always think of, I'm going to rule with God, so I'm going to rule right here. I'm going to rule. We're going to get this going. Throughout history, you see it. That's for the future. We need to get ready. How, do we become, how can we become people who can see, hear, and cultivate the lingering murmurs of authenticity, transparency, love, grace, power, community, effectiveness, joy, prayer, and honesty as we move through the moments of our lives? That's heaven. How do we re retune our ears to the call and power of God's wisdom and truth? That's living in paradise. That's living in eternity, right here, right now. How is God to redeem your life and your suffering to the point where you are able to look upon the purpose of your life and the substance of all your days and honestly report, it is well with my soul? Dallas Willard, moments before he passed away, told Gary Black. He asked him how he was doing because he was dying of pancreatic cancer. Last moments of his life, he asked him, and Dallas Willard said his last words, it is well with my soul. That's a good death. Because he lived his life prepared to step into eternity. Prayer that he, Dallas prayed for many of his students as he was uh, teaching his seminary classes. Um, and uh, I want to pray with you as the band comes up. It's a confusing topic. It's a tough topic. It's uh, a lot of unknowns in the topic. But if your theology of heaven and hell doesn't cause you to live differently today, not motivated by fear, that's not how God motivates, not motivated by wanting to grab as much, but motivated by love and care. If it doesn't cause you to live differently today, I would, I would challenge you if it's accurate or not. Dallas prayed this every time he'd open a class at Fuller Seminary or retreat. And I want to pray this over you and me. I pray that you would have a rich life of joy and power, abundant in supernatural results, with a constant, clear vision of never-ending life in God's world before you, and the everlasting significance of your work day by day, a radiant life and a radiant death. Now's our time to uh, take all this stuff and uh, see what resonates with you. As you respond, or however you want to respond, respond at the, at the, uh, for, with communion, reminding ourselves of the done deal for sin and brokenness on the cross. That truth is truth. But heaven is so much more than just getting there by the skin of your teeth. Heaven, according to Jesus, the kingdom of the heavens, is among you and can be lived into 
starting now. Maybe you need prayer for whatever, uh, if you want to just worship. And let the Holy Spirit move some of these truths in your heart. Thanks.